was so good. So good. Oh, look at this. You're all here. I'm so glad. Yeah. Hi, James. So nice to be back in person. Yeah. Hi, Josh. Hi, buddy. I'm James Ward. I work on Kotlin stuff at Google. I'm Josh. I, I work on the spring team. Uh, and uh, yeah, I'm just really glad to be here. What's our talk about? Uh, building better, I don't know, server-side stuff. Like well, better client side, we're going to try little, to throw some of that in yeah, at the end. Yeah, that's true. Okay, just building good stuff. Stuff with, yeah, with Spring Kotlin. and Kotlin. With Spring and Kotlin. There you yeah. go. There's that. We're going to have that's a little <laughs> bit of both. Uh, yeah, okay, good. So we're gonna, if you want to play the home game, follow along at home, there's a GitHub repository there. You can, you can get it and, and see what's happening for, for later. Otherwise, is this, is this being live streamed right now? It is, I think so. I think so. Good. Oh, yeah. Oh, hi, Internet. All right, good stuff. So yeah, that'll be online. It'll be online, uh, online, and all that. You can watch the recap later. Um, good stuff. So I think we need to. Well, first of all, we're going to talk about when we when we kick things off. We're going to start about. We're going to talk about uh, uh, Spring and Kotlin. And it's worth mentioning that while we're going to show a lot of cool stuff here, um, obviously we're just standing on the shoulders of giants. We're a lot of people that did really hard work. Uh, and one of the people on the Spring team that really did a lot of great work is our friend Sebastian Deleuze. Oh, um, yes. Go to his talk later. Yeah, amazing. And yesterday, there was a blog. <laughs> there was a blog in which someone described him as working on uh, all sorts of cool stuff on the Spring team, in, in Kotlin in particular, and they described him as, a, as working like a Greek hero, which is the coolest, like, you know, it, it's true. Yeah. So, so when you want to I mean, learn... He's my French hero, not my Greek hero. Well, but, he works yeah. like a, a classic, you know, yeah. you know Greek hero. Yeah. So anyway, good stuff. So, um, right. Let's write some code. Let's write some code. We yeah. don't have a lot of time. We kind of got to get into it. <laughs> we got to so, get into it. We're going to write some code. We're going to do this, as always, by beginning our journey here at start.spring.io. This is, as always, my second favorite place on the internet. My first favorite place on the internet, of course, is production. I love production. You should love production. You should go as early and often as possible. Bring the kids, bring the family. The weather's amazing. It's the happiest place on earth. It's better than Disneyland. But uh, we have some choices to make. First and foremost, what build should we be using? Well, we just announced today that Kotlin is now the default in Android Studio and other places. Um, not quite on start.spring.io yet, not but yet. hopefully sometime. Hopefully. So let's do Gradle with Kotlin. Okay, I'm, I'm I, done. And then, of course, language. It would be weird if we did anything else. Yep, Kotlin. But, by the way, the, I, I, did you notice I had a cup of coffee, Java, when I came in this room and they took it away from me? I took your job. Very, away very from serious you. about you it's using only Kotlin. Only Kotlin here. Only Kotlin you know? here. Uh, so, okay, good. So then we're, we're going to call this service uh, package, group ID, whatever it's going to be that. We're going to call it Beautiful Kotlin. Friends, down here we have some choices, some duplicitous, uh, misleading choices. We have the choice of what version of the JVM we should be using. Friends, we're going to use Spring Boot 3 and Spring Framework 6. That implies a baseline of the 17th version of the JVM, JVM 17. We're not using the Java language, of course, but you need the that one time. JDK. Yeah. JDK, JDK 17. JDK 17. Right. Okay. And so we're going to, so really, while you have choices here, you don't actually have choices. These are non choices. These are choices that you could make, but that you should never, ever, ever make. Not even when you're trying to be ironic. Okay. These are never appropriate in any context. Java's 8 and 11 are very, very old. Very old. Nearly 10 years old for Java 8, right? Uh, these are technically inferior in every way. Put another way, Java 17 and later is technically superior in every way. It's faster, more performant, more robust, more uh, you know, secure, more container ready, etc. It's just a better choice in every single way. It's also morally superior. <laughs> you won't like the look of sadness and chagrin in your children's eyes when they see that you're using an older version of the JDK in production. Don't do that. Be the change you want to see in the world. Do the right thing. Update now. Good. So, and obviously, by the way, Java, the J, JDK, JDK 21 is coming soon. That's a new long-term support, like JDK. You should be updating to that, if nothing else, just to be able to, you know, like, choose 20 just to be ready for the long-term support version coming up. Now, we have some dependencies. What are we going to do? We're going to do reactive. We're going to use reactive. That's a really good so, story in the Kotlin yeah, world, right? R2DBC. R2DBC. Let's do that. Yep. Okay. We're going to use uh, Postgres. Postgres, yep. Okay. Uh, reactive web. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, uh, Grawl, well, we're yeah. gonna, did we do Grawl already? Yep. yep. And then and some test containers. Oh, good stuff. Yeah. Right there. So that's what we're going to go through. So we need a Postgres uh, database. So I've got this little, uh, that's here, I've got this little script, and all that's going to do is I could have done a Docker Compose, I think. That would have been smarter. Uh, but I, 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 uh, I insisted on this. We're going to do the smart script. thing later, which is yeah. test containers. So. Much smarter. Yeah. yeah. We start with uh, you know, the old way. OK. So we log in. Nothing in our uh, database just yet. We've got this. Let's hit generate. Start that up, okay? 
And we're going to open this up in our IDE. And it doesn't matter what IDE you use, but realistically, if you're using uh, Kotlin, I mean, what is the other choice? What, yeah, I mean, IntelliJ. I mean, yeah, that's it. It's, it's pretty great. Yeah. Uh, actually, just just for lols, who doesn't use IntelliJ to write Kotlin? Does not. Who's the? Oh, somebody uses Android Studio. So we got okay. Android okay, well, yeah. that's Come kind on. of the same. It's, yeah. The, I meant the that suite of tools. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Is there is there even a VS Code? There is. Or a sublime? There is. You can use it, but why? I yeah. don't know. <laughs> okay. Okay, good. So we've got a new application. What are we going to do? We're going to have an application that talks to a database. I guess we need data. We need data. Okay. Yeah. So and we're enterprise, so we have customers. Right. Yeah. At least we like, we like to hope we do, yeah. right? Uh, this is going to be an entity. We're going to use Spring Data uh, R2DBC, so we'll make it a mutable, nullable. No, not mutable. Not mutable, yeah, just no, nullable. Not mutable. Yeah, just nullable. Okay, very good. So before you go to the database and say, save the customer, we don't right. know what the ID is, so it's going to be null by default. Right. Yeah. Good. Okay. Yeah. And then we need a repository here. And so if you've, if you've ever used Spring Data, uh, then you know that we have this concept of a repository. And it's just a thing that it's an interface that provides some you know, easy data access methods here. But here we've got a little, uh, a little uh, a twist, which is we can use a coroutine CRUD repository. Okay? So this is one of those many things in the Spring ecosystem that is just made better for the presence of Kotlin. So this is something that the Spring team said, hey, you know, we could use Reactor as our way to be reactive with the database. Right. But they said, in Kotlin, coroutines are kind of the way to be reactive. So let's use the co let's create a coroutine kind of wrapper around the repository so that our database calls will be reactive. So non-blocking IO back to the database based on R2DBC. So that's the magic of the coroutine CRUD repository is giving us reactive and one line of code. Right, and there's no special module here. When you use Spring Data R2DBC and Spring Data this, that, and the rest and various Spring projects, we don't have like a separate jar for Dash Kotlin. These types are in the same code bases as the regular code that's distributed for everything else, right? So it's like playing a video game where you can unlock a secret level if you're using Kotlin. These things kind of appear as extension functions and as types that are only available in that language. And it just makes, ex makes everything just that much better. I think we need so some data. We do need some data. We should, yeah, set up like our schema and some data and stuff for this thing. Okay. So schema. Dot, uh, schema dot. Uh, let's do a create if not exist table because oh, yeah. we'll, we will run into that later if we don't. Uh, and yeah. then a name, yep. And this one's not null because our our uh, data class, yeah, our data class was was right. not null on the name there. Get rid of that. Okay, so we got our schema. Now let's throw some data into this thing. Some people that are in the uh, customers. So customers. let's see. Some people in the community that are neat. Oh. Uh, you got yourself, of course. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate uh, that. Cheers. Uh, uh, we hung out with Trisha last night. Trisha. So so, yeah, put Trisha uh, in there. Sebastian, oh, wait, 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 hold on. Oh, can you do the character? Oh, I, that might just throw everything off. It's going to be like, <laughs> eh, keep um, on support weird characters. Uh, I don't know who else. Uh, just, just whatever. Okay, good. So okay. five. We got some that's, customers. That's some customers. Now we're enterprise. We got customers. Woo. But we should probably test. You know, I always dream of being test driven, like doing that TDD thing. Yeah. Um, but let's actually do it. Let's let's this time, this, this one time. Dream. Let's let's write some tests for this thing. Okay, so. Nice thing here. We're going to use uh, JUnit 5, and that supports constructor injection, which is very nice because, remember, every time you use field injection, a unit test dies. Every time. So it's important to not do that. Sure. Just be sure. the change you want to see in the world. Do the well, right thing. The, the cool thing is that this can be a val instead of being a var. So if you do the field injection, then you have to like either, like I don't know, lazy init or var it or something. Don't use yeah. vars. Use vals. Do the right thing. Yeah. Okay, so we got some records there. What do we want to do? We want to say assert. Oh, wait, oh, actually, this is going to be in a assert one. But okay, here's the thing: our customer repository. Remember, it's reactive. It's using coroutines. So to use this in a test, we there's no reason for our test to be a suspend function. That doesn't make sense. So we're going to put all this stuff into a run blocking block uh, to just block on the the everything that we're going to do that's asynchronous here. Uh, let's, should we a add a customer to you? So this is our integration test. We should like create a customer. We should get all our customers. Oh, there you go. Save. Yep, you're doing it. Okay. Oh yeah. And then we're gonna um, find one. Find. Uh, I think you can just do dot last. I don't think you need to find. Oh, do you? No. Oh wait. Oh, we didn't assign it. We didn't. Uh, sorry. Sorry. You're, you're, you're ahead of me. Your customers. Customers is yep. the one that we're running on, not the customer repository. Find also. Oh, okay. So place yeah, our customers. 
There we go. So, good. Customers, yeah, and then we, uh, we wanted to test. Do we have anything else we want to test? I don't uh, know. Seems fine. Do you, let's do the size, okay. like the total number of customers, customers in our database. Customers.count uh, is going to be equal to five plus one, right? So that's six. Yeah, last I we checked. created five. So equals. Yep. Yep. Very good. All right, simple. Living the dream here. Good there's stuff. our awesome integration test. Hey, we did TDD. <laughs> I feel good about myself. Didn't hurt that bad. Yeah. Very unenterprise. <laughs> Okay. Okay. Oh. Let's run our tests. You're running our tests. Oh no. Oh no. What happened? What did I do? <laughs> Save. Oh, we forgot to set up our connection to the database, right? Oh right. Properties. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. We gotta go. Spring r2dbc URL r2dbc colon postgresql colon localhost colon postgres. That's a lot of typing. Okay. Username equals to postgres. Password is equal to Postgres. Okay, good. So that that's okay, fine. And then we have a problem yep. here, though, because this is not going to. This will initialize an embedded database, but if you want to initialize the actual live connection to our Postgres database, we need to set that property. Let's go ahead and kick that off again. Kick off the test. Here we go. Okay. Drink some water. Fingers crossed for yay! The test pass. And of course, if we Woo. run it again, it'll surely, you know, I mean. I mean, the test should pass again, right? Right. Fingers we, crossed. If we do right? it again. Uh, Finger. Oh, okay. oh, our test so didn't pass. We ran into a problem. I think this is fairly straightforward. We understand what happened here. We've got twice as many records as we need because we have a durable connection to an actual real database that isn't being reset. Yes. So our data is being persisted yeah. across our integration test runs. Turns out there's a great way to deal with this. There's something called test containers. And what we can do is use test containers. Test containers will spin up the Docker container for Postgres and make it so that when we run our integration test, it's going to run against that, that container and then shut the container down. And there's all sorts of cool things you can do with test containers. We could run these in parallel because it's going to like randomize the ports. Uh, we can have different rules for the life cycle. So let's say we want to have a bunch, of, a bunch of sequential tests all running against the same container. That's all possible as well. So test containers makes this integration testing thing so much easier um, and highly recommended. Now, while you're writing out the connection string here, one of the cool things that I like to do with test containers in Spring Boot is I actually like to use the, not the like Docker-based container, the you know, manual or Docker Compose. I like to actually use test containers when I'm in like the dev mode cycle for uh, Spring Boot. So when I'm doing boot run on my server, I've got, I'm using test containers to then also control spinning up that Postgres database. Look did it at work? That. Yes, it did. You ran it multiple times? I ran it once, but you know. Yeah, let's run it again run and again. make sure it works. Okay. Fingers crossed. So somewhere in that output, you'll actually see test containers going and spinning up that container for Postgres. Uh, if you don't have or don't want the local Docker thing, you can use what's it called, the test containers cloud, um, which is a great way to just transparently switch over to a cloud service for doing the same thing. So pretty cool stuff around test containers. Yeah. So OK, good. We've got ourselves an actual tested uh, data access layer. I think it's time to actually, like, you know, if you build a service in in, if, you build a, if you build a data access layer, but there's no way to connect to it, did you actually build it? That's a, a philosophical que question sure. with which some of us have wrestled in university and you know, philosophy. And the answer is, of course, no, you didn't. We need an HTTP endpoint of some sort by which we can consume this data. Now, there are uh, a number of ways to build endpoints these days. You could use uh, R socket. You could use Spring for GraphQL. You could use just regular old uh, REST or HTTP, right? What I'm going to do is not, it's, it's borderline REST, but it's not even really a REST. I don't want any Restafarians coming up to me afterwards with a, well, actually, I'm just saying it's going to be an HTTP endpoint with some JSON data. It's fine. It'll be OK. Just, just bear with me, OK? So well, we want to actually. Yeah, I, yeah. Yeah, OK. We're going to just build an HTTP endpoint with some JSON data. But here, we can take advantage of one of my all-time Double Dutch favorite parts of, uh, of, of the Spring experience when pa paired with Kotlin, which is coroutines, right? So we're going to build a, uh, we're going to define a HTTP bean, right? This is going to be a bean that produces a, a router. We're going to use the functional DSL for configuring HTTP endpoints. You could build a controller, but this is just so much more fun. So we're going to build a customer repository. We'll inject that. And here you could, if you're doing reactive, you could just do router. But remember, we're working in a coroutine context, so we're going to take advantage, advantage of the coroutine router, OK? Yeah. And here you've got this sort of functional style uh, of you know, endpoint registration, server response dot OK dot uh, body and body value and weight. Not body value and weight. 
Not body? Body in a way. The reason is that body in a way takes a flow. Body value in a way takes a just value. So, so that yep. could work, but there's a problem. What if we, uh, so that, that's fine for this one, but what about if we did customers by ID, okay? We could do something very similar. We could say like server response.ok.body and await. Body value in a way. Right. On that well, one. oh yeah. Oh, yeah, you're body. showing what the wrong way to yeah. do it. Well, body value away. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, custom repository dot find by ID. We could do this, uh, and then the ID, of course, is val ID equals it dot path variable dot uh, to int. Right. Very convenient. I could do this, um, but uh, well, first of all, it's nullable. But the problem is we have to handle that situation. What happens if we have a null value? Right. So value uh, result equals this. And then what? We want to say if the result. So that's nullable. So this is showing just like, all right, we, we maybe didn't fetch our customer. What do we want to return instead? We don't want to return a server response OK. We want to return a not found. Um, and so that is the body and await on not found to yep. create that body. Now, that and then smart the casting? smart casting thing. Yeah, right. show that, how that's cool. Result is we're checking that it's not null. The compiler sees that it's not null, so it's not bothering us. It's, it's giving us that little, can you see that green highlight there? It's saying this is not null in that context of that if branch. This is the last expression in the uh, lambda, so that's the return value as well. We have to return a re server response of some sort. So technically, this is return at get. You know, it's the same thing. So let me see something real quick. Yeah. I, I want to pull the audience. So Ooh. there's another syntax that I like to use for this, which is the question mark dot let. Yeah. And then uh, you put in the, the OK one. And then you do the Elvis operator for the default. Just curious, how many people here prefer the let syntax? Yeah. yeah see, it's it's like 50-50. I don't know. I kind of like the I don't. Yeah. It just feels like it needs to be like a map or a flat map or something, you know? Well, or, or then there would have to be monads. No, and, no, I did, you know, don't. I, I, we have one rule. Oh, that's right. Gosh, I don't, said monads. Oh, Dang it's too it. early Sorry, everyone. Apologize for using <laughs> the M word. <laughs> oh, gosh, we're in polite company. Um, yeah, okay. So that, that seems, am I missing anything? That seems okay. I th think we got our server. I just really like that this is here. A, so, the oh, I guess we didn't really talk about the coroutine part of this. Well, because here's the yeah. cool thing is that underneath all this is coroutines, obviously. Like mm -hmm. the co-router says, I know how to handle coroutines, flows, or suspend functions. And so we didn't even have to like propagate suspend functions through. The co-router is just like, I know what to do with the suspend function. So boom, we're good. What are you working on I, now? You could do this, right? You oh. could do customers like... Uh, that would be a suspend fund, right? Oh, you're talking about, yeah. yeah. You can do it that way, absolutely. And it's just, it, it works just fine if you want to do that as well. Uh, you can't do it with a find all because that's the flow. So maybe, I don't know. Eh, so maybe it'll work. Whatever. You Who can, knows? The controller syntax will work. Uh, maybe that doesn't, I don't know. We haven't tried it. But, <laughs> but, but I quite like this functional style. It's just really nice. Yeah, the co-router is pretty nice. Yeah. Well, and I like not using the annotations for my routes. Yeah, but it's all, it's all programmable preference. now. You can actually programmatically register things. Okay, so you uh, started our server. And let's see if we can get some data. Nice. Yay, we have customers. Three. Okay. And okay. we get a customer. It Good. works. Good. So we've got some records. So, okay. i got to walk through one yeah. quick thing about this. Go for it. So what's kind of hidden in all this is the reactive side of things. We are using the reactive web uh, spring thing. And so that gives us non-blocking HTTP. So a request comes into our server. And then we run the, the get handler for that request. Part of that get handler is a suspend function or a flow to go out to the database and get the data. So in the time that we're actually talking to the database and just waiting for the database to respond with the data, the cool thing about the reactive part is that it takes the threads that would normally be allocated to the HTTP request handling and the database request, and it can deallocate those threads and go off and use them for something else. So that's like awesome to be thread efficient on our system. Loom will also help us with some of this, but at least for the foreseeable future, primarily on the JVM. And yeah. so coroutines may at some point be able to take advantage of Loom underneath the covers, but we're going to be able to use the coroutines on anywhere that we want to do Kotlin. So yeah. that's uh, the right. Kotlin multi-platform stuff, whatever. Very so it gives cool. us kind of this isolation of the asynchronous handling, all the good stuff with reactive, um, but without some of the limitations that we may have. Right. And it's just, uh, and if you are running on Java 17, JVM 17, JDK 17, whatever, this is still there, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. How many of you are going to be downloading and installing in production uh, JDK 21 when it drops in less than six months? Okay. The five of you, you get a, a star. 
The rest of you. You get a loom. You get you a get loom. A, you you get get a, a, the rest of you. See, I, so that's what I'm saying. For now, yeah. co jeans are a great way forward. Yeah. They're actually a great way no matter what, right? Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Now, speaking of production, it's time to Your think about... Your favorite place. Yeah, exactly. Production. We've got this application. I think it's interesting. It's obviously fast, and it does a great job, and it's using co so it's very scalable. That said, I want to get this to production, and there, there are a couple of concerns, right? One is, how do I containerize it, like put it in a container orchestra, a Docker container, an OCI image, or something like that, right? And for that, uh, friends, we have, obviously, build packs. This is a great way to turn an application artifact, be it, you know, be it a, a JAR or a Ruby on Rails app or a .NET assembly or a, Ruby, a Python app or whatever. Tur turn that application, any, any application, if it's Node.js, if it's a Vue or, or, or JAR or, or Python or Perl or Ruby or P hey, hey, hey. hey. <laughs> you can't even P say hey, 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 hey. <laughs> P, hey, 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 I can't, it's not a language, yeah. I refuse. Anyway, you can take anything and turn it into a container. It's very easy. There's a CLI you can use. But if you're using um, uh, Spring Boot, there's a Gradle and or Maven plugin, right? And those will easily turn your application into a container. That's not new. It's just interesting. The second thing I care about is making this application as small in footprint as possible and as fast as possible. And to that end, there's an interesting opportunity these days, right? Uh, I want to take this application and use something called GraalVM. Now remember, the JDK is super efficient. It's very efficient, right? It's a very efficient, fast uh, uh, technology, obviously. Um, and yeah, like 100 years of, get, of uh, JIT tuning. Yeah. 100 years. Can like, you believe if, that? If you, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So if you, if you look at this, uh, this, this is kind of interesting. Let, don't let people tear it asunder, right? Uh, the JDK is actually very efficient already. So this is from 2018, so it's old data. I'm sure things have gotten better in some cases and worse in others. But if you look at this, this is like very interesting to me, the normalized global results for energy, time, and memory. And you can see that C has a baseline of 1.0. That's the most efficient of the languages. Rust is fairly efficient. C++ is fairly efficient. Ada, which, you know, who cares? Uh, and then Java, right? Um, I mean, no, I mean, are you using Ada? Am I missing something? I have never met an Ada programmer, I don't think. Maybe I have, I don't know five in my life. Uh, so, okay. And then Java, which is, this is JDK. It's just replace that with the JVM, right? So that's 1.98. Okay. That means it's twice as inefficient as C, which is great. But look at these other languages that are also fairly popular, like JavaScript at 4.45. And you've got, you know, Python, which is very popular. Uh, it's like 35 times more inefficient than the JVM, right? So it's already very, very good, and there's a couple reasons for this. One is the, the garbage collector, right, which is amazing. Uh, and then, of course, the just-in-time compiler. And the just-in-time compiler, as you just said, there's a lot of research in that. It's one of the miracles of modern engineering. It's something that actually takes your code and finds parts of your code that are going to do a good job uh, and that don't have any fun. And what I mean by that is anything that makes dyna Java dynamic it can't use that. So anytime you do a class loading or reflection or proxies or serialization, any place where you do anything kind of fun, it, it doesn't like that. But if, you can, if, if it can identify code paths where you're not having any fun, if it's just like straight like, you know, code, it can take that code and turn it into operating system and architecture specific native code. And that's awesome because it's fast. And large organizations like Google and Alibaba and others take advantage of that dynamic. They actually warm up their services before they deploy them so that they're pre proactively uh, optimized, just in time compiled, right? This is a good thing. And the question then, of course, is why can't we just proactively compile the whole thing? Well, it's because of that dynamic fun stuff that we were just talking about. That fun stuff forecloses on your ability to, to take advantage of this just-in-time comp compilation. But what if you could tell the compiler, hey, this is going to be kind of, there's going to be some dynamic things going on here, here, and here, but otherwise, go ahead, right? If, it could, if you could account for that and just like make a, insert some shim code so that it just does the right thing and it looks like it's going to work, but it's not actually truly dynamic, that would be very convenient. Well, GraalVM has a way to do that. You feed it JSON configuration files. And when I say JSON configuration files with an S, I mean lots of JSON configuration files. Everything on the class path that does anything dynamic at all, anywhere, needs to account for this. So it's kind of one of those things where you, it's all or nothing, right? But, you know, hopefully, if everybody's done their job right, hopefully it's going to work fine by the time you come along and just start using the framework and building code on top of that. So Spring Framework 6 and Spring Boot 3 ships a AOT engine. There's a new phase, a new um, engine in Spring Boot 3 and Spring Framework 6 that supports GraalVM native image compilation and it provides all this config information. It's not going to work 100% all the time unless you, if you're doing something frameworky and reflection and all that kind of stuff, you might need to 
use our component model to tell the compiler about what's happening. It's just another bean, of course. But for most cases, it should just work fine out of the box. So let's go ahead and take advantage of that here. Uh, we're going to go ahead and go to our build, Kotlin, and we'll say Gradle W native compile. Now, the, what this is going to do is it's going to take a look at our code. It's going to find all the types that we're using, all the types that our code is using, all the types that it's using, and do an analysis on everything in the class path into our code. And it's going to keep all the types that are being used directly. It's going to throw away everything else. So if you're doing anything with dynamic class loading or reflection or anything like that, those types aren't going to be found because that's all very, you know, it's Java is, you know, the JVM is very dynamic. You can take an, you can define a class, load it, reflectively from class.for name, create, call, create an instance of it, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So this takes a long time. And it's actually a bit of a problem. It takes long enough that it kind of kicks me out of the flow, not the coroutine flow, you know, yeah. like the zone, right? It, I lose focus. I, I, I get bored. And, uh, and so finally, 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 I understand this, this cartoon, right? I think we're at, we're at a place now yeah. where I finally understand yeah. this one, right? Did you, did you ever understand this cartoon before? I never did, but now I feel like I'm part of the, the, uh, the cool people that understand this great cartoon, which is the number one programmer excuse for legitimately slacking off, my code is compiling. You ever do that? No, of course not. You had a, you've led a good life. You don't have code that takes longer than a second to compile. But it, it's, with GraalVM native images, it takes enough time that you kind of get, you know, kicked out of the flow. And so it's, and it's, the problem is it's not long enough that you can do anything useful, like respond to an email or make a cup of coffee or, you know, this is go why to... why you tweet so much. Yeah. yeah. You, you can't go to the bathroom. You can't really do anything. You're just stuck there waiting and waiting and waiting. And the problem is I start, I don't know about you, but I start to hear elevator music, right? <laughs> don't you just like waiting or like the Jeopardy music? Or I hear music. And so I, I got annoyed about it. And I actually, uh, I actually asked if they could just fix that for me. So that, so that everybody could hear elevator music. So I went to the <clears throat> official GraalVM project, and I, and I said, please play elevator music during the native image compilation process, right? Um, and, and I said, look, I, I already hear elevator music in my head while I do these sometimes long-running compilations. I'd just like everybody else to hear it too. And, and thank you in advance, and I appreciate your amazing work. And I do, I really do, I appreciate them. And, uh, and then. Uh, somebody, uh, our friend, one of our friends uh, from Red Hat suggested that we play this elevator music. And I'm not going to play it for you because I don't know if I can, but it's <clears throat> the elevator music from the GoldenEye, the, the old James Bond movie. There's actually a, a track on the soundtrack, which is just elevator music, and it's great. That would be cool. And then somebody else said, hey, you know, we could add a beep, like a beep sound, like a toaster. I mean, your toaster will tell you, will tell you when it's done. Why can't your compilation, right? Um, and, and, then, and then this gentleman... Uh, Fabio Niepaus, he's a researcher on the GraalVM team at Oracle Labs. Uh, he's a doctor and, uh, you know, uh, in Potsdam, Germany. He says, thank you for the feature request, Josh. Uh, wait, 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 wait. Thank you for the feature request, Josh. The problem with playing music during the compilation process is that it's just fixing the symptoms and we've been and are still working on the cause, making GraalVM native images more efficient in terms of time, memory, and CPU consumption. Right? Uh, anyway, he continues, I have prototyped a dash dash Josh Long mode. But for some reason, he continues, I have the feeling that my PR will be rejected, probably because of the copyrighted music. On a more serious note, we could add a dash dash ring bell when done option that prints the bell code after the compilation process. And this is what that would have looked like, okay? Here's my dash dash Josh Long mode prototype for GraalVM native image. Uh, and so you, you, know, you would have said native image dash dash Josh Long mode, right? And then it would have done this. It would have played the music and then showed you music brought to you by by Josh Long. <laughs> it's, yeah. yeah, that'd be amazing. That would be awesome, right? That's the feature we deserve. Uh, so anyway, I don't think he's going to, I don't think it's going to get merged. But maybe we'll get a, like a ding, which is, you know, I'll take progress. Uh, uh, anyway, I think our build's done. I might actually pay for the enterprise <laughs> edition of GraalVM if they got that feature <laughs> added to it. That'd be great. Yeah. Uh, is it done? Oh, is it? Other window. Yeah, okay, there you go. Woo. One minute. It's done. Oh, that's painful. So, build, native, build, compile. Okay, so, Kotlin. Oh, uh, whoops, I, do I have the other app running already? Oh, you yeah. Might, yeah, you got to shut it down. Or uh, else have port conflict. Okay, there we go. So, there's our application uh, in 92 thousandths of a second. Uh, uh, you know, that's, that's, that's good. Nice and fast. That's fast. But more important, which I don't care, actually. I don't really care about the startup time unless you're worrying about serverless, in which case this is great for you. What I care about is this. So this is the process identifier. I'll take that, 
PS minus O R S S. There we go. So, uh, no, what's the? Well, <laughs> what did I do? Oh, it's this one down here. I started it. Uh, I got wrong the wrong pin. Process. We had the same issue. There we go. So that's about 112 megabytes of RAM, which is pretty great. Like, pretty I don't know how much great. RAM your application is taking in production. Is it 100 megabytes? A little more. Is it a little bit yeah. more? Is it, is it a lot more? It's OK. <laughs> You're among friends. Just, it's OK. So anyway, yeah. Amazing. Much better, right? OK, and now yeah. what? Now what? OK, so we've got our server. It's got all the reactive stuff. It was GraalVM nat native imageified, and that's all good. But we thought, like, hey, we should do something kind of like crazy with this thing. We should try to build a Wasm front end for this thing and see how that goes. Because Kotlin Wasm's like this new cool thing, and it's very early, experimental, all that. But why not try it, right? Right. Right? So let's, let's get in here and give this thing a try. Okay, let's go back to here. Okay, where um, like three in I don't directory. I don't know how to use your computer, so oh, we're, yeah. we're going to see how this goes. Um, <laughs> we we uh, so we need to convert this project that Josh built to a Kotlin multi-platform project, yeah. and to do this, I think we should use ChatGPT, right? Because be it's really good at just like taking things and outputting hallucinations and stuff, right? right? <laughs> Uh, okay, so we're going to run this Gradle task called Multify. Was that what it was called? We, well, so we wrote a custom task. Yeah. Uh, and we, we had debates on the names. Uh, let's just do a quick uh, yeah. informal poll. Yeah. Okay, so Multify, to transform our code base into a, a multi-platform multi project. Multi project. 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 Yeah. Uh, it's, morph it's not a very good name. No, we were, it's, it could be better. Yeah. It's morphing time. It's morphing time. We thought about that. Yeah. Nobody, I didn't think good. anybody. Okay. We thought about using like un and then the F word yourself. <laughs> yeah, like the, you know, so Gradle, that word, that didn't, we couldn't find a great name, so yeah. we're just going to stick with that. Yeah, we're just going to stick with that. Um, Yay. Okay. Yeah. So we multiplied, um, and yeah, I mean, what a great thing that AI could do for us is just take mm -hmm. our, our project. So I want to walk you through the structure of the project, what we just changed, and so you can see kind of the, how things are set up here. So we have our server, just like we, Josh, had built. It's the, the same code. We didn't, we didn't do any tricks there. No smoke and mirrors on that thing. <laughs> um, but what we are going to do is actually take this customer data class out of the server. So one of the cool things about multi-platform is this ability to share code across different platforms. And we're going to just do a small example of sharing a little bit of code. And the code that we're going to share is going to be that, that customer. Okay, so we've got our server, same thing we saw before. And then we now have our Wasm front end. And so Wasm is, I, I'm totally fascinated by Wasm. We, yeah. we were talking with Sebastian yesterday about oh. it. I think there's a lot of fun stuff happening with Wasm. Uh, I think it, like the, the pitch for Wasm is that, sure, you could take Kotlin and cross-compile it into JavaScript, but there's a lot of challenges and problems with that. Whereas with Wasm, you're going to bytecode that runs in the browser. You're going to uh, bytecode that you could potentially run as a standalone process through one of the Wasm runtimes. So it creates this kind of portable format for applications, and one of the places you can run them is in the browser. So I think the, the Wasm stuff is interesting. Let's take a look at our Wasm app. So some um, caveats here. This stuff is like really early. There's, there's some developer experience sugar that has not been applied yet. You know, we haven't sprinkled the sugar on, on this, this stuff yet. So there's some weird stuff. It's gonna get better. But here's the cool thing, is we can write a little app that's going to use from Wasm, call out to the DOM and the DOM JavaScript APIs and call window.fetch to make our request to slash customers. And then we ignore the as dynamic stuff. I'm sure that'll get better. But here's the cool thing. We can take a promise in JavaScript and using coroutines, we can convert that promise into a coroutine. So now I'm using coroutines in my Wasm application that's going to run in the browser. So that's pretty cool. Very cool. Okay. And then there's another coroutine here because when we parse the JSON, that's also a promise. And so we're going to do our coroutine on that. There's some missing pieces in some of this. So I had to like create a proxy to the JavaScript array and then you know do this like kind of ugly loop through that thing. But ultimately what we can do is we can get our data from the server that Josh built. We can then append an element to the DOM for each of the customers that we get. And we're going to just throw the, the name on there. 
So that's my like terrible, terrible front end with Wasm. I'm like, I'm surprised that like stuff is as far along as it is. The fact that it actually works is pretty amazing, but it's, it's not all the wonderful DX sugar that hopefully we'll get to you um, soon. Okay. So yeah, what else do you want to know about that code? So that customer array, what is that? The JS customer array. So what this is, is in the JavaScript side, we have an array, and we're going to get our data back as an array, and we need to be able to run through the elements in our array, and we're actually going to do that on the JavaScript array, and so there's this fun little thing here called external, and external says, like, we're going to we're going to like program as if this class exists in Kotlin, but really what's happening is that these calls are getting called on the JavaScript structures underneath. And so that's the external piece of that. So this is just allowing us to make an at function call on the JavaScript array and the access the, the length val that's on the JavaScript array. So, that, so in JavaScript, there's a function called dot at. There is. And yep. there's a property called dot length. That's it. And so it's exactly one to one. We're just mirroring that. That's it. Okay. Yep. Yeah. So again, not like this is early days, but some exciting things uh, potential here. Okay. So now let's let's go implement our common code. So I pulled that customer out of the server because now we're going to write that as common shared code that will be able to be reused across, in this case, our server and our WASM application to our Android application or iOS application, wherever you want to run Kotlin multi-platform. So let's go write some code here for uh, that common code. So I'm going to create a new Kotlin class and let's call this thing customer. Mm. Now here's the, the magic with Kotlin multi-platform is what I can actually say is that I'm not going to have my customer class defined in my Kotlin code. Instead, I'm going to say, all right, I expect that each platform that I'm building for targeting with Kotlin multi-platform, each of those will have a customer implementation. So you're seeing that there's uh, some red squigglies here under customer. The reason for that is that IntelliJ is actually telling me, hey, you need to actually give me the implementation of customer for the JVM and for WASM, because those are the two platforms that I'm targeting. But before we do that, I do want to add one other thing in here, which is my customer is going to have a name, which is a string. Okay, and then what we're gonna do is create our actual classes. So there's the expect side, which is the shared code, it allows me to, to have shared Kotlin definitions across multiple platforms. The actual side is the implementation for a given platform. So I'm here in the JVM version, and oh, I forgot to add the package name. So let's go do that. What is my package name? Bootiful, Bootiful Kotlin, I think. Uh, package bootiful dot. Kotlin, and let's copy that. Okay, now back over here, let's go add that thing back in. So on the JVM side, we actually want our, uh, our implementation of customer to look like it did in the server code that Josh wrote. So what I'm gonna do is, and I should have actually just copied and pasted this, but let's write our actual data class customer, and we're gonna use the at ID annotation from Spring, and this is a val ID, which is a nullable int, and then we're gonna have our val name, which is a string, and because our our name property was on our uh, expect side, we need to actually tell this that, hey, that's, that property is the actual property as well. Okay, and I think that that's good on the JVM side. Um, let's now go back to our expect side and let's come in here and create now the WASM side of this. So for the WASM side of this customer, I need to do that little trick that I showed earlier with the external. And so what my customer is going to be on the WASM side is going to be an actual uh, external class customer. And the val will be uh, have a name with a string. And then I'm going to probably need to say that that is the actual as well. Okay, so there we go. Now we've got our implementations for our different platforms. There's a couple different ways to do this depending on what you're trying to do. We have another version of this where we actually we put the data class into the common code instead of having the actual classes in, uh, in the, the platform code. But for this one, this is the way we, we went. And so why aren't you using a data class here? 
Uh, because I need it to be an external class because what's going to happen is my array that I get back from calling the server, it's going to have JSON, like JavaScript objects in it. Right. And at this point, this is early days, there's not a good way yet that I've found to deserialize that structure oh. into the data class. Okay. So I need Kotlin X serialization to support WASM and I don't think it quite does yet. Um, and so that's why I'm doing the external class here is I'm go just going to look at the name property on the JSON structure that's on the JavaScript side of things. Okay, thank Kay. you. Okay, so let's go and start up our server. Hopefully this uh, server is not I, I think it's, is it going. still running? Is it? Where? I, did we, well, I had the native thing running at one where, point. Where, where? Uh, oh, there yeah. we go. Yep, yeah. let's close that down. I don't know. Yeah, one, okay. One? Here we go. Let's do server well, uh, you might be boot the wrong run. Oh, am I in the wrong? Yeah. Oh, thank you. Saving, saving me here. Touch just keystrokes. Okay. Great old W server boot run. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Let's, fingers crossed, our server now compiles and starts using that common shared code for the customer object. So it looks like that worked, right? Yep. Okay. So now let's go off on the other side and go to our WASM web app and let's run WASM browser run. And then we can do this minus T to do the like automatic reload on compile kind of thing, which I don't know if we'll use, but, um, but it's pretty cool. Okay, so this is going to now take my Kotlin WASM code, take that, that uh, common code, and compile it all down into WASM bytecode. And then I'm going to be able to, hopefully, load up this application, this WASM application in my browser, and see that code that I showed you that was adding, making the, the window.fetch request, getting back the customers, and then adding them to the DOM. Hopefully, that will all work. So let's go over to our browser and... Let's pull up localhost 8081 is where that's running. And boom, yay, we got our customers. Nice. Yeah. So let me, like, to show you that this actually worked, let's go actually see the, some of the network requests here. So let's reload this thing. When, we, when this thing loads, what, what it's going to do is, uh, I think today in, in the world of WASM, you have to load WASM through JavaScript. And so the Kotlin WASM stuff will create this JavaScript wrapper that then loads the WASM file. So where do I see the actual, I don't know how, how to use your, is it somewhere down here? What, what are we looking for? The network oh, request. Look at all. All. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, it was filtered. Got it. Sorry. Okay. So we made our request to localhost. That then had a web page that loaded the JavaScript file, which then just loads the WASM. But there we go. That's the WASM file. Then you'll see we, uh, you can ignore this WS one. That's for the auto reloader in dev mode. But then you can see we get our get request to slash customers, which gets our customers, obviously, as, as JSON. But that WASM piece, that's the amazing part. And Chrome doesn't know how to show you the WASM because it's bytecode. Code. But that's the, the cool thing is that we loaded WASM in the browser and this makes us makes it able to be able to run applications much faster in the browser. And there's some other really cool stuff happening in WASM, which go to Sebastian's talk uh, yeah. later today, I think, yeah. if you want more details on this. Now, why didn't we just use Kotlin.js? We could have. We could have used Kotlin JS, right. um, but Is WASM. So, so I did some experiments around WASM, like just like really, really basic stuff, where I just had a, a Kotlin Fibonacci and I compiled it for Kotlin JS and compiled it for Kotlin WASM with like no optimizations. It was three times faster in WASM, which is pretty amazing. And I'm sure that there's much more headroom to even get around this. So I, I think that this is like the future for how we take applications written in non JavaScript languages and run them in the browser and, and potentially on servers and serverless. So looks good uh, to me. Yeah. Oh, and we're out of time. We're out of time. Okay, we'll be around if you have other yeah. questions, but hopefully that was useful for you, and thanks for coming. Who learned something? <laughs> Who had fun? I had fun. Okay, good. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. All right.